the first reading is from Acts. It's on page 114, sorry, 1114, uh, Acts 17, verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed, among them Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Second reading is on page 1039 of the Bibles. It's Luke 9, verse 18. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Simon. You might like to keep that passage from Acts open as we think about it together. It was on page 1114, if you've mislaid it. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it reveals to us how we can make the choices you ask of us. And we ask that you'd help us as we think about it together. Give us ears to hear what you're saying and hearts willing to be changed. Amen. Choices. Life is made up of lots and lots of choices, isn't it? I had a friend who was a missionary in Kenya for a long time. And she used to say, and I know Sam and Abby, I've talked about this before, that when they came back to this country, going to the supermarket, overwhelming the sheer number of choices that we have to make. We've all made choices this morning, haven't we? We've chosen which is the coolest shirt that we have to put on. We've chosen what to have for breakfast, unless you're a person of habit who saves that choice by always having the same thing. According to scientific research, don't ask me how they work this out, the average adult makes 35,000 choices each day. Now, some of them are small, like which band of coffee to buy, what to watch on the telly, and others are life-changing, like moving house, or getting married, or choosing to uphold. As Sam's just been talking about the ways of God when faced with the tax office of South Sudan. Being followers of Jesus is about the choices we make. It's that choice we made, as we heard Sam describe, to follow Jesus in the beginning, but it's also about those choices we make day by day in each situation we face as we seek to be faithful to him. 
Now today is the last of our mini-series on lessons from Athens. To remind you, we're looking at this passage because it's the one the bishop looked at with the PCCs when they came. And lots of you said, it'd be good to do a bit more thinking on that. We began with John helping us to think about where Paul went in Athens and the different people he met in the synagogue, in the marketplace, in the Areopagus. And then last week, we thought together about what Paul said when he was invited to speak at the Areopagus, how he began with the point of agreement with his audience. You are deeply religious. But how he explained that the unknown God they worshipped was the creator of all things and knowable in Christ Jesus. And today, Paul moves from that point of agreement to something that might be a bit more tricky, as he invites his audience to choose whether to believe in Jesus or not. The observant among you will have noticed that today's reading began with the word therefore. And in Paul, that always means we have to look back and we have to look forward. Therefore, Paul is moving his audience towards a choice, but a choice that's based on what he's just said. He often uses therefore, doesn't he, in his speeches and letters as a pivot point, as he links truths he said with actions that should follow from those truths. Perhaps most famously in Romans chapter 12, he says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, because of all that he's written in Romans chapter 1 to 11, because of who God is, we should offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Paul began by looking and listening so he could understand the people of Athens. And we talked last week about how we might use some of what we discovered in the listening project to help us know where the people around us are concerned. He told them about that creator God. But Paul doesn't end with we are his offspring, children of God, which is where we stopped last week, on which the audience would have been quite happy that have said, there, yeah, brilliant, great. He keeps going. He moves on to talk about something they're going to find challenging. He moves on from an intellectual discussion about the creation of the world to life-changing truth about who Jesus is. Therefore, he says, or in some translations, since this is true, the fact that God is creator of all things and they are his offspring has consequences. It's not just a nice fact. Because God isn't an idol created by people, Paul says, but the creator who lived and died as a man, Jesus God isn't unknown, but knowable in Christ, who will one day judge the world, bringing that justice for which we all long. And the proof of all this is the resurrection of Jesus. And therefore, the people are invited to turn away from idols and turn to him. Therefore, they are invited to repent. I thought it was really interesting in what Sam said, and we hadn't over-talked this, that sin and the barrier, that roadblock, was a big part of his choice. But repentance isn't a very popular idea these days, is it? Certainly not in this country. Recognising that we got things wrong, saying that we're sorry. We tend to blame others or make excuses. When I was teaching, I'm sure Abby gets this sometimes, the child saying, but their classmates made me do it. Or Dominic Cummings driving to Barnard's castle to test his eyesight. Not only is it difficult for people to say sorry these days, it seems, but of course it's even harder for us to all be doing that bigger step that is repenting. Because repenting is about more than just recognising what we've done is wrong. It's about turning away from it and trying not to do it again. I always remember when I was a child, uh, my mother, who is a wise woman, but also from Yorkshire, so you don't cross her, would say, OK, you've said sorry. We've had a big argument with my siblings, possibly a little bit of 
fighting, surely not, over something probably quite trivial. And she said, okay, if you're really sorry, then don't do it again. If you're really sorry, next time your sister annoys you, however annoying it is, be kind. Don't thump her. Choose to do something different. And of course, as we all know, repenting isn't something we just do once, is it? We have to do it whenever we stray from God. That's why we, we say the confession each week. That's why it's really good at the end of the day to review the day with God, what's sometimes called an examine and see where you are thankful and see where we need to say sorry. Because the truth is, folks, that we're works in progress and we will need to keep repenting until the day we die, when then we will become perfect. Repent, says Paul. But of course, repenting isn't quite as hard as we sometimes make it out because the Holy Spirit will help us. The Holy Spirit will change us so that we do things God's way, so that we worship God and not other things, so that we become more like Jesus. It seems to me that the idea that we're sinners People who think we know best how to live, not God. People who think we can transform ourselves into perfect people, which is what the self-help industry tells us, is a stumbling block for many people today in deciding whether to follow Jesus is good news. For Paul's audience, the idea of repenting doesn't seem to have been the crunch point. It's the idea of the resurrection that causes difficulties for his audience. And Paul knew before he started talking about it that it would be a problem because to the Greek mind, the concept of resurrection was both unbelievable and actually quite offensive. Paul may have adapted how he spoke because of his audience, but he's not going to change the message. And the resurrection is a critical part of the message of who Jesus is, because it's the proof that he is who he said he is, and he can do what he said he can do. So Paul doesn't duck it. And the response to him is mixed, as he knew it would be. Some sneered, some wanted to hear more, and some became followers of Paul and believed. The title I gave today's section of this reading is Time to Choose. We heard about the time that Sam chose whether he was going to follow Jesus or not. For me, it was a mission where someone began where I was, that there's something missing in life someone, as it turned out, and went on to faithfully share the story of how it was Jesus that I was looking for, only Jesus that would fill that God-shaped hole in me. I wonder, what was the decision point for you to follow Jesus? Maybe it's so long ago you can hardly remember, but we're all here because at some point we made a decision that led us to make the choice that on a hot Sunday morning, we'd be sitting in Sunnyside. For me, a bit like with, with Sam, it was the altar call. I'd never been to an altar call before. I'd come from a very traditional Church of England church where I sang in the choir despite not believing a word of it. And the, at the end of the second day at the mission, it was a three-day mission, at the sec end of the second day, the man at the front said, anybody of you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. And I found myself quite against my better, better ideas, I think, stood there, getting up, standing there. And whilst we were being prayed for, the song, Father God, I Wonder How I Managed to Exist, was playing. So a song that still has um, an important part for me. But of course, it's not just one choice. As Sam and Abby were saying, it's a series of choices we make each day. And for me, it's Jesus. It's the faithfulness of God that I've experienced over the last 32 years. 
that's made the costs and the challenges of making the choice to follow Jesus worth doing each and every day. Your decision points will be different. There will have been different ways you came to faith. There'll be different things that keep you making that choice day by day. But whatever it was, there was a point where we had to make a choice. One of the things that Bishop Michael said that I thought was really interesting and was statistics I hadn't heard before is apparently it takes an average four years for a person to go from hearing about faith to choosing to follow Jesus. Now, chaps, I'm sorry, it takes you on average five years, us ladies three years, but it's still a long time. And have you noticed in this story how Paul began by speaking to thousands in Athens and we end up with a little handful of converts at the end? But Paul doesn't seem to be discouraged by that. And those little handfuls of converts added to the other little handful of converts who faithfully caused the gospel of Christ to be preached down the generations so that we heard the message ourselves. In our gospel reading, we heard from Luke in the most important question we will ever face. It's that most important choice again being asked by Jesus. Who do you say I am? That's what it boils down to. It's not enough just to answer that easier question, who do the crowds say I am? We can all have a guess at who other people would say Jesus is. But it's a good question to ask other people as we meet them. Who do you think God is? Who do you say Jesus is? Because it will give us a chance to start a conversation. But the, who other people say Jesus is isn't the question that matters in the end. It's who do I think? Who do you as individuals say? Because each and every one of us needs to choose for ourselves whether to believe Jesus is the Messiah he said he was, as proved by the resurrection or not. And then each and every one of us needs to choose what we will do with that answer. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, I wonder how will that truth affect the choices we make today? How will that truth affect how we share the love of Jesus with others? How will that truth change God's world as more people come to know him? Amen.